Hi, everyone. I'm John Gannon. I'm a product manager here at DigitalOcean and just wanted to thank you for joining today's webinar and AMA session with our special guest, Paul Jarvis. Uh, Paul's the author of a new book called Company of One, and he's the co-founder of Fathom Analytics, uh, which is actually available on the DO marketplace. Uh, Paul's done digital strategy work with companies like Microsoft, Mercedes-Benz, Warner Music, and his ideas have been featured in Wired, Fast Company, USA Today, and more. His current focus is on digital privacy and challenging traditional rapid growth mindsets. And uh, he's worked for himself for the last 20 years. Uh, and I've been following his work for quite a while as well. So it's, it's definitely a treat for me to be able to be a part of this uh, AMA. A couple quick things before I hand it over to uh, Paul. Number one, there's a questions window that you can submit any questions uh, that you'd like uh, Paul to try and answer by the chat. And we'll address those uh, as many as we can. At the, uh, at the end of Paul's uh, short presentation. And then the other thing I wanted to call out uh, right before we hand it over to Paul is that uh, for the first 300 people who have been on this webinar uh, who go to do.co slash fathom, and we'll share that link in a minute. If you go to that link and spin up uh, the Fathom Analytics one click, uh, you'll get a free autographed copy of Company of One as a bonus. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Paul. Hey, thanks so much, John. Thanks so much everybody else for, for being here and chatting today and sharing your time with us. So I'm just gonna talk a tiny bit, like five minutes or so about growth and then it should give everybody kind of a, a good idea for like questions that you might wanna ask me, but really I'm happy to answer anything so it's called an AMA so I'm just gonna go through quick presentation and then we can get to answering the questions that you all have all right so the importance of intentional growth the idea here is that growth isn't bad it should just be questioned before proceeding so growth for the sake of growth is the ideology of the cancer cell, which is one of my favorite quotes. It's from 1978, um, Edward Abbey. And really what it means is that growth needs to have a reason for happening, not just because growth equals good or because you heard from some growth hacker at a marketing conference that if you aren't growing, you're dying. Growth needs to have a reason for happening and we need to be intentional about it. So. A few stats on unintentional growth, because I think that there's this paradigm in the business and entrepreneurial world that all growth is good always. Well, looking at research, because I've spent a few years researching this for, for my latest book, Company of One, I found that 74% of businesses fail because they scale up too quickly, which was from the Startup Genome Project, and 67% of the Inc. 5000 list, a list that a lot of startups want to get onto, well, five to eight years later, 57% of them went out of business. And these two stats highlight the idea that companies can go out of business because they're scaling too quickly, because they're growing too quickly, because they're outpacing profit and focusing instead on growth. So the idea here is that growth makes sense. It always makes sense until it doesn't. And the idea here is that we all need to go, when we start a business, from zero to something. We need to go from no revenue to some revenue. We need to go from no customers to some customers. And so in the beginning, we see that growth is in fact great. Growth does in fact make sense. But if we never question it, if we never say, hey, maybe it makes sense until it doesn't, then we're just gonna continue in that mindset. Because I think for a lot of businesses that we can reach a point of diminishing returns where we end up building a business that maybe has grown so big we aren't excited to run it, which I've actually done a few times and had to shut down a few businesses because of it. So I think it all comes down to this, when we're founders, when we're entrepreneurs, when we're whatever you want to call us. So what type of business do we want to run? So intentional growth means that we get to choose the type of business that we want to run. So for myself, who doesn't like having a huge company, who doesn't like managing a lot of other people, it wouldn't make sense if I started a business like Airbnb because a business like that requires scale to work. It can't just be Bob in Boise, Idaho, who has 
one guest room and that's the only property on the website. A company like Airbnb needs a lot of volume, a lot of customers, a lot of properties, a lot of staff to run. And so it wouldn't make sense if I started a business like that. So knowing the type of business we want to run that can help inform the decisions that we make moving forward, which is really just making us intentional. So how do we determine intentional growth and how do we determine when growth makes sense? Well, there's a few questions that I think can really help us figure that out. And the first is what is enough? What do we actually need? What does our business need? The next is how will we know when we've reached enough? And the final question is what will change if we do? And what I mean by that is if there's no good reason for us growing in certain areas, then maybe we just don't. And determining enough is different for everybody. And I really think that if we think about intentional growth and we think about enough, that's kind of the counterbalance or the antithesis of this current unchecked growth paradigm. So not all business goals kind of in this vein of being intentional about business growth, not all business goals are created equal. So a lot of business goals, especially when we're thinking about rapid growth or high growth, are artificial targets set for the sake of artificial targets. They're set for the sake of setting targets, like, oh, I need to 10x this or 10x that. And these made up numbers can really function as a source of unnecessary stress until they're either achieved at great cost or abandoned. And the problem is that these made up goals become absolutely real the second we start working towards them, which I think is actually kind of scary. So I think we need to think about how we can set realistic and well-intentioned goals around what we really need. And to do that, we have to be honest with ourselves about what is enough and what is realistic to achieve in humane timeframes, not basically working ourselves to death or hustling too hard. So our own version of success can be different from what we read on TechCrunch. We may actually be happier if we're not the next unicorn tech company or the next, or we don't raise $10 million or IPO. If it's, I know I don't want those things personally. And if it's our business, I think we should be able to take the reins and guide it. We should be able to determine what success means. And that's different for everybody. That might be different for you. That's, that's different for me. So the point here of intentional growth isn't to never grow. It's to only grow when it makes sense. And it has to make sense to us, the, the founder or founders. It has to make sense to the lives we want to lead. It has to make sense to our profit or our margins. And finally, it has to make sense to our existing customer base. We always have to keep them in mind when we're growing. So if we're intentional about our growth, then we can build a business we actually enjoy running. Because I really think that any business at any size, any job you have is a lifestyle business because every single job or business that we have comes with its own choice in how we want to run it and how we want to live outside of it. So that's it. That's all I have to say about intentional growth. You can, like John said, check out uh, my company, uh, Fathom Analytics, which is privacy focused website analytics. And you can install it from the DigitalOcean one-click marketplace by going to do.co slash fathom. So let's stop me sharing slides and let's get into uh, the AMA. So I'm going to stop my screen share now. And I should be back on the screen. Hey, John. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Paul. Appreciate that. So let's start with this question. Do you struggle to have ideas for new projects in your business or do you end up having uh, too many ideas and sort of like struggling in terms of like what, what should you not do or what should you drop? Yeah, that's a great question. And I guess if it was just up to me, I wouldn't know what to pick and what to drop and I wouldn't know what idea to run with. I have all of the ideas all of the time. The way that I kind of determine what I want to work on is basically the way that I run my business. So I don't know how to run my business and make products and then find a market for them or make products and find customers for those products. Instead, I know how to listen to a group of people, see what they want, see what they need, see what they're asking me, see what they're struggling with, and be like, okay, the skill set that I have or the skill set that I can bring together in a team is something that can solve that problem. And those people seem like they're the type of people who would be willing to pay enough for that product to be profitable. 
So I always kind of, I, honestly, I let my audience dictate the products that I make. Every single product I've ever made has been dictated by what my audience has basically asked of me. Otherwise, I have all the ideas. I would just run in all the directions at all times. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, let's move on to the next question. So uh, the next question is, in the company of one, which I just finished reading, loved it, uh, you stated that you should begin talking to people who are looking for a service that you're knowledgeable about to determine their problems and find your initial customers. So, so where do you find those individuals if you're starting completely from scratch, i.e. maybe you're doing this as like a side gig initially and you don't have a client list that you can you know, really kind of tap into straight away? Yeah, I mean, I think it comes down to building your network. Like I think at all business at any levels is who you know. The reason I'm doing this is because I know you from my newsletter, John, right? So like everything in business is about connections between two human beings. So I think in the beginning, if you're, if you're looking to start somewhere or you're looking to find an audience, just start talking to people, just start getting to know people, and whether that's going to conferences or networking events, whether that if you're introverted like I am, maybe that's using social media or just reaching out to people who you follow and saying like, hey, I, I really like what you do. I'm not trying to sell anything. I just wanted to say, hey, it's funny, the, um, the, the partner that I have in one of the courses that I teach, Creative Class, her name's Kaylee Moore, she reached out to me years ago and was just like, hey, I, I love the work that you're doing. I'm a copywriter. I don't really have any agenda, but did you want to get together for like a virtual copy? And I said, sure. And then two years later, because we ended up starting to talk to each other, she's now a partner in one of the, one of the products that I make. So I think a lot of it just comes down to like building your network, expanding your network, starting to pay attention and communicate with people that you're seeing who are doing maybe similar things or related things. Got it. Okay. Uh, so uh, I have a quick question that's actually uh, one that, that I came up with that I've always been curious about. You work across all these different projects, right? You just mentioned one. Um, how do you, you know, sort of do you, do you form those all as separate businesses or like what what's the structure of that? Because I think uh, there's a lot of folks on this uh, webinar, for instance, who probably have multiple things going, and so it would be great to hear kind of how you organize that and set those structures up. For sure, and I'll caveat it with that I'm in Canada, so it's slightly different depending on what country you live in. But I've always been a firm believer that the, any business you do needs to be separated by a legal entity from you as a person and the customers or the clients that you have. So 20 years ago, I started a Canadian Corporation, which is the same, like in the States, I think it's like an LLC or it's an S Corp. Or I don't know the words for the, <laughs> for the States. But basically, I created a, a legal entity. And so all of my projects start as products of that business, it's called Mighty Small Ventures. So they all start in that business. And then if they start to do well and there's a partner involved, then I'll spin them off into other companies. Like Fathom operates under a business called Conva Ventures because that business started with a partner. And I've since transitioned to another co-founder uh, who's also in Canada. So we spun that up as another Canadian corporation. But we only did that when we had the revenue to do so. We operated it under one of our businesses first because it's expensive. It costs over a thousand bucks to start a business. So if I was starting a business for every product or every idea I had, it would get expensive. So I run them all under my business and then basically transfer the assets and intellectual property to another business once it starts to do well or once there's partners involved. For all of my courses, I just run them because it's just me outside of um, working with Kaylee. And she's just, I just pay her like a contractor for that. But yeah, so that's how I do it. So I have a couple companies, but they pretty much all start under the, the main business that I have. Awesome. Thanks. Let's shift gears a bit and talk about uh, salary. So uh, the next question is Hey, Paul, when should you increase your salary as a company of one and by how much percentage of the new income? Yeah, I've always, because I've worked for myself for two decades, I feel old, um, I've always kind of looked at the following math formula for how I kind of figure out salary, because for me, I don't like 
like working for myself, I, I was never really interested in having all of these fluctuations. Like, oh, I pay myself tons of money this month and then no money this month and then kind of some money. So my salary in the beginning, at least, was always just the sum of the 12 months previous divided by 12 to give me basically the, the average amount that I made it as like an equal payment because my expenses personally are fairly even like and my mortgage doesn't change my the the food doesn't change month to month my utilities don't change so i was always trying to find an average and now it works slightly different but similar in most other countries the more you pay the more you draw out of your company the more personal taxes you have to pay so i know going back to the slides that i was talking about i know what enough is for me personally so I pay myself basically the bare minimum salary for myself to live a comfortable life and to support my family. And then the rest of it, I just keep in my company or invest through my business because if I take more out of my company, I have to pay more taxes. I don't want to pay a lot of taxes. I want to keep as much of my money as possible and not give it to the government. So I pay, I pay my salary hasn't changed for ages because I know how much I need to make. And I could increase it, but it's enough, so so I have it for quite some time. Okay, thanks. So you mentioned uh, a little bit about, uh, just when you responded there, about sort of defining like what is enough, and you, you talked about how you sort of set up your salary based on that that last 12 months, basically. Uh, but how do you think about that, like, like looking forward, like in the future, like, there's probably things you want to do or buy or you know whatever the case may be so one of the questions For is really sure. you know, how do you define that not just now but but in the future yeah and i mean i think it's important i guess to separate that enough isn't the bare minimum enough is comfort for myself and for most people so i know that paying myself what enough is it's giving me slightly more than I need. So I always have a bit more money, which I typically just put into investments. I'm just a squirrel <laughs> <laughs> with finances. So I just put it into investments. In Canada, it's RFPs or TSFAs. In the States, I think it's 401ks and something else. But I basically just want to make sure that my money isn't losing money. So if I'm investing in the entire market through things like index funds, that I know that I'm going to be making more than inflation and therefore my money isn't losing value over time. But if I do like, but there is some money that I keep liquid for in case I want to put like a bulk payment towards my mortgage or in case I want to go on vacation with my wife or something like that. So enough for me is enough to cover all the things I need, the savings and retirement plan that I have, and also a little bit extra in case I want to do, in case I want to enjoy life. Basically, if I want to do fun things, then I have that or in case something goes catastrophically wrong and then I have money for that as well. Gotcha. All right, let's, uh, let's shift gears. We have another Company of One reader here who said, uh, Company of One came at the perfect time for me at a time when I knew I was being made redundant and that I needed to take control of my work life by becoming a freelancer again. So thank you for that. My question is, how do you qualify leads and ensure that you're working on projects that best align with both your goals and your values? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I'm such a process nerd that when I was doing client work uh, instead of um, product work now, when I was doing client work, I had kind of an onboarding sequence for people where it would start. And I found the easiest way that I qualified leads was I put the starting price for my work on my website publicly. So it said like projects start at this much money that decreased the number of leads I got, but it made it so I was only getting leads that were basically self-qualifying. And then I would send them a PDF with, this is what I provide, this is what I don't provide. These are the customers that get the most value from the work I do. These are the type of projects that I don't take on because I can't provide as much value. I think, and as much as like I automated the crap out of it, like there was an automation sequence that went from MailChimp to Typeform to a PDF, to Calendly, to a Dropbox link. Like, there was a lot of automation to save me time, but I never automated out having a quick call with people. 
I found that especially if you're in services, in client services, or especially if you're competing like mid to top of market, projects live and die on communication. So having a quick call with people, even if I was signing like an enterprise account for somebody, for one of my products, probably want to have a quick call just to see like one, is there a good fit? Two, can we communicate well with each other? Do we understand what the other person's saying? Do we feel like there'd be shared value? Because that's what business is, is creating shared value. Somebody gives you money and they get something in return that they feel is worth it. So I, I do think as much as I like to automate everything, especially processes, I do like to just involve uh, real-time conversation. That's, that, that was net, I could never get rid of that. Awesome, thanks. Okay, so now uh, we have to go down the professional sports road. We have a question about uh, how did Steve Nash and Shaq find you and what did you advise them on? The burning question. Yes, so remember, I think it was the first question. Somebody asked like, how do you find uh, people to work with? And I said, networking. That's how I found them. So I was working at the time, I was doing a bunch of websites for people and I was just trying to expand my network. And one of the people that I knew was a pro sports agent. And so we would talk often and he was like, I heard, and remember this is a long time ago. So he had just heard about the internet, <laughs> really dating myself. He had just heard about the internet and he was like, I think my athletes can build their own brands and monetize them. And nowadays this is like, this is just what celebrities or influencers do is they monetize themselves as a brand. But at the time that really, like that wasn't happening. And so I was like, well, I can, I can help do that. I can set up e-commerce stores. I can make websites for your athletes and they can start selling things and they can make money from the internet. And yes, it's legal. It's so a lot of convincing that it was like above the board to sell things on the internet. <laughs> and then I was just, when I built a bunch of sites for, for, his, um, for his roster, I was like, well, are there any other agencies that you know or any other agents that you know that might want to do similar? He was like, oh, totally. And then, then thus began my work in, in pro sports for a number of years. Fantastic. Yeah. Maybe... To, to kind of peel the onion a bit on the networking piece. So uh, I, I, I know that you kind of live out in the woods, right? And you're not in a major city, but clearly you've like built a, a an interesting and kind of strong network. So I guess, are there any tips you might have for someone who maybe isn't in a major city? You mentioned the virtual coffee. I'm also curious, are there other ways that you're, you, you sort of are able to really build and maintain that network, even though you're not in New York or San Francisco or Toronto, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Thank you for mentioning Canada. <laughs> uh, so I did actually used to live in Toronto and then I lived in Vancouver, which is a big, which was a big startup hub. It still, it still is. Um, I lived there, I guess, between 2000 and 2010. So that definitely did help, but I don't think it's, it's easier in that way, like if you do live in a hub, but it's not impossible if you don't. Like right now, I'm the only person in the area that I live that works on a computer. Like it isn't, it's a very rural area. But like I use social, so I mostly dislike social media. John, and you know this from being on my newsletter. But I do think the value of social media is connection without location. Like it doesn't matter where in the world somebody is. But I think social media is good to start conversations, but it's really hard to create authentic and establish relationships just living on social media. Like me liking your tweets isn't really going to form a bond with you. But if I start on Twitter and I start or LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever it is, like if I start there and I find people who are doing similar work or related work and I find them interesting, and then I start connecting with them there, then maybe I'll say like, hey, why don't we just jump on like a, a Zoom call or a, or a Google Hangouts and chat and then just get to know each other. Like I find people who work in my industry or similar industries pretty interesting. Like I don't, I also don't feel like anybody's competition. I feel like a lot of my friends have similar businesses as I do, but we share a lot, like we share a lot about our businesses because it's not like there's a big enough it's not a zero-sum game especially indie business on the internet 
we can all learn from each other. We all have more in common than anything else, even if we're in competitive markets. So just talking to people and then keeping that relationship going. I mean, I do struggle with this, but even if it's a matter of having like a notice in your calendar once a month, like reconnect with like the 10 people that you spoke to last month or two months ago, just to keep, just to keep in touch, just to keep in touch to see what, what people are doing, what they're working on. If there's any way you can help, if there's any way they can help you. So yeah, I mean, right now, because I live not in a tech hub, it's, it's digital, it's connecting online, but then I bring it off of social media into virtual. And then sometimes, like sometimes people will happen to be on the island I live on and then we'll actually get together in person. It doesn't happen very often, but sometimes it does. So yeah. Excellent. And one more on the networking side of things, and then we'll we'll shift gears again because I, I think um, there's some interest also in, in kind of your process around writing. Uh, but but at least for now, the last networking question would be: you, now you've built a, a pretty substantial sort of personal brand and email list, right? You're you're emailing people every Sunday. It's going to I don't know 20, 30 thousand people at a time. So I, I know you get inbound from people asking you for different things, and, and, and in some cases probably asking you, hey Paul, like can you get on a call with me? Can you do a, a quick chat with me, et cetera? I would love to, to sort of know, and I think the audience would love to know, like how do you sort of choose out of all of that? Like who, who, like how do people really effectively connect with you personally? And maybe even an example of, of where this has happened recently. Uh, I think that would be, be really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I don't, obviously I don't have time to talk to all of the people at all times, but I do kind of look to see like is is that is that is this person somebody I could learn from is this person somebody that could learn from me and then sometimes it's just like if I'm super busy it's a no to everybody because I value my time and energy and have very clear boundaries and so sometimes it's just a matter of like when I was launching the book over the last couple of months it was a no to everybody but sometimes there's, I don't like to be busy all the time. So sometimes there's time to do that. And I mean, I guess I always make time for subscribers with email. Like if I, I usually get, I don't know, 150, 250 replies every week when I send out my newsletter, part of my job is to learn from and to talk to and connect with my audience. So I take three, four, five hours a week to connect with people in that way. And so while I can't do calls with everybody, if somebody asks me a question on email, I'm gonna do my best to answer it. And so that's kind of the way that I, that I connect. But I mean, the other thing is like, you don't always have to connect with people that are like the most known in an industry. Like I could reach out to people who are way more known than me and probably not hear back from them. And so for myself, it's always like, I'm looking for people who are kind of at the same level, who are probably struggling with the same things that I'm struggling with. And in the beginning, it was people who were just starting out and we had the same things going on. And then as we all grew, we all kind of reached like a, a bit higher of a, or just got further down the path that we're on. So, I mean, it doesn't always have to be like, oh, I just want to connect with these like huge influencers and I'm not a huge influencer, but like, it's not a matter of like, oh, who can I connect with who's like a big deal? It's more who, who can I connect with who's interesting regardless of where they're at or maybe they're in the same place that so we have more to share with each other. Interesting. And do you think the, 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 the piece you mentioned about taking three, four hours to really go through all those responses that get to the Sunday dispatch, do you think that's, it's a bit of a rhetorical question, but, but you know, has that really affected your, uh, you know, sort of ability to kind of grow and build all the things you, you've built by taking that level of care and attention and, and really kind of engaging? Yeah, and I mean, I think that is a good question because a lot of times people are like, I can't believe you, have, you make time to do that. And I'm like, I can't believe I wouldn't make time to do that. Like this is a direct line of connection with the people who are buying from me, with the people who are paying attention to me so it's like i need to i need to have this communication because these are the people that i'm learning like you asked like how i picked like what i need to work on next those emails like it's almost always like i look for patterns in those emails for a while i was getting a lot of questions about freelancing over and over again over the course of a couple of years so i was like i can teach a course on this i wrote a couple articles about intentional growth and challenging growth 
and I got thousands of replies for those emails and I was like there's a book here so I was like I can write a book on this and then when I was pitching um, agents and then publishers I was like this topic is the most replied to topic that I've seen in the last few years of my mailing list and they're like well, there's popularity there, there's interest there, there's money to be made there. Like an agent isn't going to sign um, a new author unless they think that they can sell the idea to a publisher. And a publisher isn't going to uh, like give an advance to an author if they don't think that they can sell this idea to the market. So in having that, I'm basically building proof all the time with maybe I get like 50 replies to this email, this isn't something people are interested in, probably not going to write about it again. But then if it's something like the growth thing where I was getting thousands of replies, it's like, ah, there's like there's something here. And if I didn't take the time to read and reply to all of these people, I wouldn't have that path forward to, to make things and to do things and to basically <laughs> be profitable. Thank you. So on the topic of writing, what, what, what's your writing process? You sit down every Sunday, like how do you get past the blank page? That was a question that, that came in from, from sure. the audience. I'd love to hear how you, how you sort of face that. <laughs> yeah, um, so I don't, so my newsletter goes at Sunday morning at 6 a.m. PST. I'm not awake then, well, sometimes awake then. It's, auto, it's, it's scheduled, but I don't write those emails Saturday night because I don't feel like so first of all, I've never missed a Sunday in the six years that I've been doing it other than scheduled breaks, which I feel like that consistency and that cadence is really, really important to show people like, I value this list, so I'm gonna share with you every Sunday, no exceptions. And then people in turn are like, oh, okay, if he's putting this much time and energy into this, then maybe I should pay attention if it's right for me. So I typically write my newsletters four to six weeks in advance. Because I don't want to, if I was sitting there Saturday night staring at a blank page, I'd just be like sweat dripping down my face. Like, I don't know. I need space to, to create. So I need the space to be like, this is an article that I want to write. This is something that my audience has been talking about. I don't have to write it this hour, but if I know that it's going to come out in a month or a month and a half, then I can be like, okay, I can sit down. Like, today's my writing day, so I can sit down and write this. And then it also gives me time because I'm not the best technical writer. And P.S. You don't have to be a great technical writer to be a writer. I'm not a good writer at all. I'm good at putting ideas. I'm I'm good at communicating ideas in an interesting way, but I'm really bad at putting sentences together. So by writing my stuff a month in advance, I can pass it over to a few friends. I can give it to my copy editor that I have. And we can get it kind of polished because if it's not polished, I'm going to get more emails and they're not going to be good. Like if I have one typo in my email, I'm going to get an extra 200 emails. <laughs> and I read all my emails, so it's going to be 200 extra emails to go through. So I need to make sure that my writing is basically book quality every Sunday because I want people to be responding to the topic, not responding to typos. So it's it's a month or so in advance, and that's how... Because sometimes like maybe I got a busy week and it doesn't matter if I skip a week because then I'll be like five weeks ahead instead of six and then I'll write two articles the next week. So yeah, that's that's a process for that. Good, I, yeah, I didn't know you had that, that kind of buffer built in, but uh, I can see why that would be super, super helpful. So question uh, just came in about research and development related to entrepreneurship. So the question is, Development and research, it's an important part of entrepreneurship, but with limited work hours, it's a struggle to really make time for that. So do you make time for development and research regularly? And if you do, are there any tips for, for how one might start doing that for themselves? Yeah, I think it's building a habit. I think that early on, I didn't do very many smart things as an entrepreneur when I started, but the smart thing that I did was always have time to learn and always have time to, to spend time researching and trying new things. Like even I started out as a web designer in the 90s using like tables and flash. Like I couldn't get away with making websites if that's how I was making websites nowadays. So I've always taken at least a few hours a week, sometimes it's more. If I'm writing a book, half my time is research, half my time is writing. If I'm working on a software product, 
a lot of my time is research or a lot of my time is user testing or QA or talking to people who are beta testing the product and watching them go through it or talking to them about what works or what doesn't work. So it has to be built in. Like it has to be a habit that you have that like the time it takes to build, say, a software product isn't just the time it takes for you to write the code and execute it. It's the time it takes for you to research whether it's something that you can build, whether it's something the market wants, whether it's something that the market is going to pay for that keeps your business afloat and profitable. It has to be time to do the research and to talk to people. I think a lot of times, especially with making software, a lot of times people are, are very adverse to having conversations. And I think that is really important. Like I can send out a survey to my audience and learn quite a bit of quantitative data, which is useful in some regards. But unless I get on the phone with people, like unless I'm real time and I can hear their tone or I can see their facial expressions or I can see them frustrated with something I built or elated with something I built, that kind of qualitative data is just so useful for for making things so it's like honestly it's hours a week at minimum for that and when i'm actually in the weeds with a project it's more and that's just like i just know that that's part of the time frame like if i'm if i'm scoping out a project i know that quite a bit of that time is going to be like research and talking to talking to people thank you so let's shift gears again, and, and I want to move into another one of the areas that, that you definitely have an interest in, which is, is, is privacy. And uh, I wanted to mention before I, I asked this next question that came up uh, or mentioned to the audience that um, Paul uh, and one of the, the various uh, companies and projects that he works on, one of them is an analytics package called Fathom Analytics. And maybe Paul, uh, as part of answering this next question, if you could share a little bit about that, I think that would be fantastic. But um, that that analytics package is available on the DO marketplace. And um, just go to do.co slash Fathom, F-A-T-H-O-M, and you can learn more about it there. And if you decide to spin one up and you're one of the first 300 folks who uh, do that from this webinar, uh, we'll send you a, a free, or Paul rather, uh, we'll, we'll get you a, a free company of one book. So the question, uh, currently many companies make money by collecting and repackaging user data. Uh, do you see this as intrinsically a bad thing? And what will these companies look like when these practices are made uh, illegal, uh, impractical? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question because definitely the way that both governing bodies, especially in Europe and the way that kind of consumer sentiment is going is that we've kind of in probably starting about 10 years ago with the kind of advent of very popular social media, we kind of traded not having to pay for things with them being able to collect and repackage and sell data on us. So Facebook technically is free, but they're getting a whole lot of data about you. And that for the longest time, people were just like, okay, this trade up is okay. But then with like Cambridge Analytica and Zuck having to testify in front of two different countries, Congresses, and just kind of there's a, there's a shift in kind of the consumer landscape where people are caring more. Like it used to just be people like wearing tinfoil hats who cared about privacy on the internet. And now it's like my parents understand the, the importance of privacy online. So we're also seeing a lot of regulation like GDPR, um, e-cookie laws different um, possibly monopoly busting things coming up where governments are like, hmm, maybe this self-regulation didn't work in tech because self-regulation has never worked in the history of self-regulation. So maybe we need to step in and start making changes that are for the best. But I think like, I look at Fathom as, as, as one example and there's tons of other examples, but Fathom is what I know because it's the, the business that I started. Fathom, so I believe that privacy is a common, so I believe that privacy is not just for people who can afford it, it's for anybody who wants to value it, which is why for Fathom, there's a free version, there's a community version on GitHub, there's never, that's never gonna go away, the community version, because I believe that everybody, if they wanna value privacy, then they should be able to 
regardless of cost. And that's why working with DigitalOcean and there's a really easy one-click install for Fathom Analytics that you can spin up on a droplet, do.co slash Fathom. But people, we also have a, like this is also a business for myself and my co-founder, Jack, where we, if people don't want to install it and maintain it and update it, then we sell a paid version at Fathom Analytics Pro where people can get the analytics without having to basically manage a server. And so that's how we make money. And then people, and the funny thing is like, some people are like, why would I pay for Fathom if Google Analytics is free? That's fine, they're, they're not our customers. Because there is a large group of people who are like, I don't believe in Google as a company or their practices with how they use data and the way that they do advertising. So I will gladly pay for a business to do my analytics and not take customer data from all the visitors to my website. And so they value privacy and they're willing to pay for it, which I think is a good thing. And like, we're never going to compete with Google Analytics. We're never going to be as big as them, but we're big enough where we're profitable and we're big enough where there is a market for people who are like, hey, I value this. This is something that I care a lot about. Maybe I don't want to have that cookie notice about collecting personal data on my website. So Fathom seems like like a really good option. And that's like we can exist in such a tiny portion of the market and be profitable because we are a small business that it ends up it ends up working out. Excellent. In terms of business challenges that, that you face as as someone who runs all of these, call them company of ones or single person businesses, there's a there's a question about that in the chat. Really trying to understand, like, what are what do you personally face, uh, given that that you're you're running these businesses today? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely it feels like juggling sometimes, right? But on the flip side, I see people like Jason Fried and DHH who have like one product. And they've been working on Basecamp for 20 years. And some days I'm like, oh, that just sounds great. Like just do one thing every single day. But then I know when I spend too much time doing one thing, I'm bored and I'm like, maybe I should build that thing that everybody's been talking to me about. And so I've kind of come to terms with the fact that I like that sometimes I'm writing books, sometimes I'm producing podcasts, sometimes I'm making software, sometimes I'm teaching courses. And I like that it varies day to day. So I never get bored of any one thing because I have a bunch of different things on the go. The challenge there is scheduling. The challenge there is figuring out, okay, I know how much time I can effectively work in a week without like killing myself. And so how can I schedule things? So when I was writing the book, there weren't any major software updates for Fathom. I didn't open up any of my courses during that time. I didn't record any podcasts. I didn't even do interviews during that time. And then when I'm working on a new release of Fathom, we're working on B2 right now, I'm not writing another book at the moment because I'm working on the next version of the pro side of the analytics. So it's more just like I'm really good at single tasking, like working on one thing for a couple of weeks at a time, doing like a sprint or if you're in an agile or that sort of thing, like doing like a little like work really hard, really focused on one thing, stop, my day becomes absolutely different. I work on like podcasting and recording and producing shows for a couple of weeks. And then I work on like the next book for a couple of months. So it's more just a matter of like, okay, what can I get done? Like, honestly, what can I get done? And then how can I work on one thing at a time? I mean, the only caveat to that is probably do about 15 to 30 minutes of support every day across the various products that I have. But I tend to just get that done in the morning, turn it off, check it the next morning, get it done. Yeah. Paul, what, what's the most common mistake you see beginning freelancers or entrepreneurs making? Um, I think it's the, the first thing that we talked about. I think it's trying it, it's making something and then trying to find somebody who wants it like it's really hard to offer a solution to the problem if you don't know who you're solving it for which is why i've always gone the like build an audience listen to that audience 
build a product because I know they want it. And I want like, it's, it's reducing risk. Like I don't like to take risks. I'm very risk adverse. And so I'm always looking at ways that I can build my entrepreneurial path in a way that is the least risky possible. And I think building things slow and iteratively is another big one. Like you don't need to, if, if you're looking to solve a problem, you don't need to spend a ton of money in the beginning to solve it. Most of my businesses start with like a laughable amount of money, like mm -hmm. registering a domain name, getting a $5 droplet and doing a couple other things. And then as I see a need for the thing or if I do pre-sales or if I just open up like a very small V1, then I see like, is this gaining traction? Like business is hard. Like if we can make a couple things easy, like even Fathom Analytics started with me spending maybe an hour or two designing a mock-up in Photoshop, tweeting it and seeing who likes this. And then it took off and people were really, really interested in it. So we built a very tiny um, open source version of it. And I think we've had over like a million Docker pulls at this point. And we have like 5,000 stars on GitHub. And we, but people were like, I'm not a developer. I don't know what to do. And they were like, okay, this can be, this can be a business. And then we started it and then we got a bunch of customers and we we're like, okay, now we can build a bigger version of this because we're generating revenue and that. So it's always like, just take a little step, a little step, a little step. But the first step is, learning that there's a group of people who have a problem and that you can solve it. Yeah, so clearly that turned out really well. I'm wondering out of every Fathom Analytics, how many get not so far and then they get scrapped? Because I think just hearing that, you might think, oh, it's Paul Jarvis and he just like, of course it worked, right? But yeah. what about the things uh, that don't work uh, and, uh, and how common is that in your world? <laughs> about half. <laughs> half of my things end up doing well long term I'm happy because it's just like a lot of it is guessing a lot of it is like t you can take a lot of guesses out but there's still that is somebody going to pay for this like people saying that they value something or people saying I would pay for that is so 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 different than somebody saying oh it's available now okay I'll pay you for it like everybody says they'll pay for everything and then you get to a point where it's like, okay, here's the, like, here's the payment form. Like, do you want this? So for me, yeah, it's, it's about half. I've shut down a bunch of businesses because they didn't end up doing well or I've sold businesses where I didn't want to put the time and scale into making them. I've also closed businesses that, and like I talked about in the slides, that just weren't a good fit for me. Like I've had businesses that made decent revenue but required like half a day of support a day. And I didn't want to hire, I didn't want to build a support team as I scaled the revenue. Like that to me didn't make sense for the type of person I am and the type of business I want to run. So I've had to shut businesses down or sell them off because it's, yeah, half. If I'm over half, I'm happy. If I'm under half, I need to pay more attention to my audience. Okay. Yeah. So the, the 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 question window is blowing up. A lot of great questions coming in. So, uh, but we're also kind of getting close to the hour mark. So uh, maybe we'll just hit a a few more here. And and let's shift gears back to the the networking side of things. Someone had asked, uh, what advice would you give to someone who dreads networking? You mean like I dread networking? <laughs> I mean it's. It's part, so here's the thing, and it's tough love, but networking is part of business. If you wanna be a business person, if you wanna own a business, if you wanna run a business, you have to figure out how to do networking in a way that works for you, right? Like I have ton of social awkwardness, I'm ton of anxiety, very introverted, but I still, like I'm not gonna go to conferences, like I don't do conferences, I don't even speak at conferences, because that to me, because I know if I do those things, I'm not going to network. I'm just going to stand there silently and just not participate. So I don't suggest doing all of the things, but I find I suggest finding what works for you and leaning on that. For me, it's doing a lot of things online or doing a lot of like Skype or Zoom calls or emails with people. I'm a writer. I'm very comfortable writing. So I think networking, you have to do it. 
there's like that's just part of business like you need to talk to people especially in the beginning but how you do it is more up to what fits your unique personality and style and how introverted or extroverted you are and i mean i've also never used that as a crutch like i more use that as a way to decide what i should do and what i shouldn't do um, as far as being like introverted or awkward. So I just find that I would never say like, oh, I'm introverted, I shouldn't do networking or I'm introverted, I'm, I'm not right for talking to other people. It's just like, I'm just gonna find a way that works best for me where I can feel the most comfortable. And the, the, thing, with in, the thing with networking, just like pretty much anything else, the more you do it, the more comfortable you get doing it. Like it's probably gonna be difficult in the beginning. But the way you get over it is by doing it, and then it becomes slightly less difficult, and then a bit less difficult over time. Okay, thanks. We're gonna flip over to the whole product launch process for you. And this question is, what does the idea to launch timeline normally look like for you? And, and also, how do you avoid users becoming disengaged if development of the thing that you've announced or pre-sold or whatever takes too long? Yeah, I mean, I like to, for me personally, I like to get things out in a month or two, whether it's a course or software product. With books, because I have a traditional publishing deal, it's about three years. So that's the anomaly because I don't have control over that. But for my own projects where I get to make the rules, I like to do things in a couple months because I can spend a few months developing something where I'm not getting paid. And remember, from idea to launch, you're making no money unless you crowdfund or, or, or take investment or something like that. So you want to ideally narrow the window to what can I launch as quickly as possible to start making money. And I mean, with the book as well, like I got a book advance, so I technically got paid before I started to write it. So that made it okay that it took years to, to get there. But for everything else, if I'm not getting paid uh, before I launch it, then I want to start to figure things out as soon as possible. And ideally, try to get paid as soon as possible. Like if somebody says they want to buy something, I want to give them that option. Like even if, if I'm on the phone with them, I learned this from Nathan Barry, the guy who runs ConvertKit. I think the first 10 people that he talked to about ConvertKit to try to convince them to use ConvertKit, he had like a payment page set up before it was even, before the, the software was even live. And so if at any time during the conversation, they're like, yeah, I would use this. And he's like, okay, well you can sign up right here. Like you can put your credit card and start using the system here. And I'm like, that's smart. <laughs> that's a good idea. Because you want to like strike while the iron's hot or whatever the, the saying is. I think that that's good. And the sooner you can get to getting money from people who say they're interested the better and if it is going to take longer email is the best way to keep them engaged i'm a big fan of austin cleon a writer and he wrote a great book called show your work if the if the development roadmap is going to take a while from start to finish share the process share what you're doing why you're doing it what you're working on screenshots videos things like that, and you're going to keep people engaged. You're gonna keep people feeling like they have a piece of it. Justin Jackson does this really well. He has a product called Transistor, where he has a podcast about building a SaaS, which he releases every single week. And he does videos about building a SaaS. And so people, before you could even buy it, people could learn a lot about his process from start to finish. And he really kept people engaged. And now his MRR is pretty awesome. So it, it worked. ConvertKit's MRR is also pretty awesome. I think they're past seven figures a month now. They all have open, they all have open metrics on bare metrics, so I can see <laughs> their revenue. Yeah, Con ConvertKit is, is getting a check for me every month too, so uh, I'm, uh, yeah. I'm definitely in that boat. And I noticed with Fathom, I, I think you actually have your roadmap. It's on Trello, right? So yeah, it's public. anyone can well. go and look at that, you know, kind of comment or contribute to that, which I, I think is great. Yeah. All right, so question about your podcast, Company of One. Is the Company of One podcast going to continue? It is. So that podcast is a lot of work because 
So I set it up like the shows that I like are mostly Gimlet shows or This American Life where they're produced where like the narrator will talk for a bit and then it'll be like a clip of an interview, then more talking and then some music back. That's hard to do and that takes a lot of work. So I've recorded all of the interviews for season two a Company of One. I'm in the process of narrating and producing the stories for all of them. I'm hoping that is out in May. But yeah, right now I'm working on Fathom V2, so I'm going to get to that next. But I, pr I appreciate people uh, wanting to hear the next season. It's just so much more work than like, because uh, the other shows I do are interview shows, or not interview shows, but conversation shows. So I take the audio of me and my co-host talking, I give that to my engineer, and I'm done. Like I basically do the podcast in real time. Company of One is hours of work for each 10, 15 minute episode. So <laughs> it's a lot of work, but it is, it may is when it's coming out. There are a lot more great questions in the questions window. Uh, we are running short on time. So I wanted to ask you one more question that came from the audience and then sort of wrap things up. So, and this question is, it's something that a lot of folks, folks like Seth Godin, uh, write about, um, you know, I, I, I know you've, you've kind of referred to it on occasion as well. Uh, the, this question is really focused on the, the resistance. So when you're working on something and you're feeling resistance, how do you identify if that resistance is a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah, I mean, a lot of times because, yeah, I mean, I don't have a ton of self-confidence, so I feel resistant to everything. <laughs> it's just the, the way that my brain works. But I, I like to think of it um, kind of along the lines of like, what's the worst that can happen and try to mitigate that risk. And so, and this is why I'm a big advocate of like starting small and iterating. Like if I started a project and invested like hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars into it, if it failed, that would hurt a lot. So I'm always trying to think of like, what can I do to, like if the worst that can happen is that it goes into the 50% failure rate for my products, then it's not that big of a deal. So that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is I treat it like a job. Like accountants or lawyers don't show up at their work and be like, I'm not inspired to account today. Or I'm not inspired to lawyer today. Like it just, like it doesn't happen. Whereas like if you're a creative and well, programmers are creatives as well. Like if you write code or write words or, or, or draw like or design, if that's your job, if that's what you want to make money on, you have to, like sit down and do the work. Like I sound like Stephen Pressfield right now, but it's a Stephen Pressfield writes really well. So I think that like if I have work to do, even if it's creative work, then that's my job. So like I have time in my calendar. That's like writing time. So it's a few hour block. And that's when I regardless of whether I feel inspired to write, regardless of whether or not I'm motivated to write, I sit down and do it. And the funny thing is, and I think people have this kind of confused, mostly because of like quotes shared on Instagram. But I think that, I don't think we need to be motivated to, to do work. I think we have a kind of um, the opposite. I think if we do work, we get motivated to do it. So I'll sit down and I'll be writing and I'll be writing like really, really slow because I don't feel like it. And then within 10 minutes, I'm like, just like writing like crazy and I'm in the flow. And so if I didn't sit down and kind of force myself to do it, if I let the resistance win, then I wouldn't do it. It's the same with design. Like I think, and the more I think we do it, I'm more the think we, the more I think we kind of develop our skills at being creative on demand or working on demand, that just, it, the easier it gets. Like in the beginning when I started writing, it was really difficult to kind of get into it. But then because I write hours and hours a week, it's it becomes a lot easier to just kind of like okay this is my writing time i don't have a ton of time so i'm just gonna like spend this time writing it ends up working out same with design same with code it's just like i just this is this is how i make money this is how i support my family i don't really have a choice in ignoring it so paul th thank you so much uh this has been a real treat i know for me and judging by all the questions that were coming in I think everyone in the audience was was super excited to to hear what you had to say and uh, hear some of your thoughts about Company of One and all the things you've been working on. So, a uh, couple quick reminders. Uh, one is we are going to be posting a PDF of the slides and video 
to the uh, to the DigitalOcean blog. So that'll be available shortly. And then again, if you're interested in privacy and analytics and sort of the intersection of that, if you go to do.co slash fathom, F-A-T-H-O-M, you'll be able to check out the Fathom Analytics one click that uh, Paul is the co-founder of. And if you are one of the first 300 folks to spin it up, you'll get a free copy of Company One as well. Thanks so much, Paul. Really appreciate yeah. it. And thanks thank everybody who joined. Yeah, thank you everybody who joined. I probably won't regret it, but if you have a question that I didn't answer, just hit me up on Twitter, PJRVS, um, or just look for Paul Jarvis on Twitter. I'll do my best to answer uh, questions that you have there. So yeah, thanks again for watching everybody. Cheers. Cheers, bye.